Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an infinite line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Makeshift Stories presents Episode 286, Morally Complicit, Part 2, read by Alan V. Hare, opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, things may not always be what they seem. Kenzo stopped outside the building and directed his contact lens HUD to display the message again. You're being followed. You need to acquire the target before they do. There was no sender ID, although it had come through Sagenetics's secure messaging system. He didn't need to be reminded of what was at stake. He had to find Dr. Morales and get her back to Cascadia so she could be charged along with the other Aphrodite conspirators or face prosecution for not reporting an embryo theft scheme. So what if someone else got to her first? They wouldn't be able to arrest her. Morales hadn't broken any of the few laws that existed in the Great Plains Economic Zone, and there wasn't an extradition agreement. She would have to go back to Cascadia willingly, and he knew the only way to convince her to do that. The manager was miffed you walked out without donating to the girl's spinal rejuve fund, Carmen reprimanded as she walked up behind Kenzo, unnoticed, making him jump. I went back in and gave him 200. You never know when you might need someone's cooperation again. Plus, I feel sorry for the girl. I wouldn't want to use an exo for the rest of my life, no matter how good it was. Stem cell spinal regrowth is the only real fix, and it's expensive. Kenzo ignored her continuing to examine the message metadata for clues as to who had sent it. What's with you, Kenzo? Carmen demanded impatiently. I just got a message. Someone at HQ is concerned I won't get to Morales first. They warned me that we're being followed. That woman you think you've seen before? Maybe, I don't know. They didn't say who, Kenzo explained. I want to run an ID on the drone footage of her. Let's go. Kenzo watched Carmen upload a video clip containing the best images of the mystery woman. The software immediately isolated the face and began to map its unique geometry. Then, it searched SynthBio's security files, paging through images too fast for Kenzo to follow. After a few minutes, the program stopped and the screen went blank. Nothing, Kenzo cursed. Wait, be patient. Carmen leaned back in her chair to wait. That was just the first pass. Now it's doing a deep analysis, so there's nothing to see. A few minutes later, a beep announced the end of the search, and a results window appeared. No match. So it's a dead end, Kenzo cursed and stood up, kneading his forehead in frustration. Carmen logged out of the system. Against her advice, Kenzo decided to walk to his hotel located in a secure commercial enclave on the other side of the Dead River just east of where the old business district had once stood. He needed time to think. He had trained to be an intellectual property enforcement officer, not a detective, and spent most of his time watching drones fluoresce crowds of people in search of unlicensed genetic modification markers. Tracking down clues and interviewing people was outside of his wheelhouse. Kenzo suddenly felt trapped like a rat in a maze with no way out. Three years ago, when he had tagged a teenager on a routine crowd sweep at an outdoor concert, he had never imagined it would lead to uncovering an embryo theft ring operating out of an exclusive genetics clinic, Aphrodite International, or that he would agree to look the other way until the teen involved turned 21 and got the licenses for her mods to make her legal. The mother's arrangement with the clinic was outright blackmail, undercount viable embryos so we can siphon them off or will out your daughter for the unlicensed mods we made to her in payment for your help. It had been a rash decision, and now he was the one being blackmailed. Bring back Morales, or... The cracked asphalt bridge deck subtly bounced out of sync with his steps as if another person had started to walk across it. Kenzo snapped back to the present. He found himself alone on the footbridge spanning the dry riverbed that cut the city in half. The sun had set, and a solitary streetlight reluctantly flickered into existence casting his shadow in front of him. He turned to see if anyone else was on the bridge. Was there movement in the shadows behind the glare of the streetlight? Kenzo shaded his eyes and stood frozen to the spot, surveying the area. When nothing happened, he turned back and began to walk faster. Every instinct told him he wasn't alone, 
that someone was lurking in the darkness behind him. With each step, the tension coiled tighter within him, his senses on high alert. As he reached the end of the bridge, the lights of his hotel ahead beckoned like a beacon of safety in the night. But just as he approached the entrance to the elite-gated commercial district where it stood, a flicker of movement caught his eye, and he thought he felt someone brush by behind him. Kenzo whirled, heart pounding in his chest, ready to confront the person who was tailing him. But there was no one in sight. The sense of being watched lingered ominously. He shivered, presented his pass card to the automated gate, and slipped into the hotel's grounds, ensuring the gate closed behind him. I got an idea last night, Carmen informed Kenzo the following day, pulling up a map on her workstation. She traced a rough circle in red around a point on her screen. The kids are on foot or bikes, so they can't live that far from the makerspace. If we flood that area with drones, we might be able to spot one of them. They can't stay inside forever. Kenzo nodded thoughtfully. Great idea. Let's do it. I had a similar thought. Pull up a list of small gene mod clinics within walking distance of that area, he said, pointing to the rough circle on the screen. The maker space manager said the kid's mother worked at a small modder clinic, so it can't be that far away either. Who knows? We might get lucky. A quick search produced five clustered together on the far side of the old business district. They were on the edge of walkability, but still reachable for someone who wanted to avoid auto cabs and ride shares where they could be tracked. We should check those out, Kenzo urged. Fifteen minutes later, at Carmen's insistence, they had walked a few blocks from the office, cutting up side streets and back lanes, checking to ensure they weren't being followed before hailing a random autocab. She gave it directions, and they got in. As the cab negotiated the potholed streets, Carmen turned to Kenzo. I warned you not to walk. That area outside of the hotel enclave is sketchy. Are you sure someone followed you last night? It was more of a feeling, Kenzo admitted. I didn't see anyone. Maybe it was meant to intimidate me, to warn me off the case. Maybe, Carmen said, turning away so Kenzo couldn't see her knowing smile. The cab slowed to a stop, and they got out onto a dusty street. The wind had picked up, blowing soil and sand from nearby vacant lots into the windowless skeleton of a glass tower looming over them. Across the street from it was a Xeriscaped park surrounded by razor wire, where a security bot was checking passes at its entrance. This way, Carmen directed and began walking toward a low-rise campus-style building complex that had, at some point, been plopped down to replace a crumbling block of office towers. Three of the shops are in there, she nodded at the complex. They made their way across the disintegrating, sun-baked hardtop to the entrance. Carmen flashed her ID through the plate glass, and a private security guard on the other side buzzed them into a luxurious multi-story atrium lined with small stores. She discreetly slipped the guard a wad of cash, which quickly disappeared into a pocket. He made a show of checking something on his handheld, then waved them past. Access is restricted to people from the enclaves, and the place is not even close to high end, Carmen complained. But around here, a bit of cash opens every door. She winked and led Kenzo up to the second floor past clothing, jewelry boutiques, coffee shops, and small restaurants. Being relatively early, there were only a few shoppers who looked in no hurry, as if they weren't worried about returning to a job. Carmen turned into a smaller corridor where professional services were located. The first mod clinic was a trendy-looking studio geared to cosmetics, hair, eyes, skin, and minor physical adjustments. The owner, a modder with lime-green eyes, who had obviously indulged a bit too many times in their products, claimed to work alone but pointed to another clinic on the main floor, where some older people worked. Two shoppers almost knocked Carmen over as she led the way to a business called Forever Young. It specialized in anti-senescence treatments and turned out to be sandwiched between a discount fashion boutique and a pharmacy in a narrow arm of the mall that had been carved out to resemble a quaint side street in a Spanish town. The owner, a no-name geneticist of indeterminable age, offered less-than-cutting-edge treatments at discounted prices. She wasn't busy and was happy to talk. I have two assistants, or at least had, she corrected scornfully. One phoned in and quit this morning. They both have a kid. 
Kenzo showed her a still from the exoskeleton vid on his handheld. Yes, that's Kumar. He's Chandra's kid. He's been in here once or twice. He seems quite smart. Chandra is the tech who quit. I liked her. She was good. You're the second person interested in her and her son. When were they in here? Kenzo demanded, jerking the hand held away. Just a minute ago, the clinic owner replied, eyes darting between Kenzo and Carmen. You would have passed them on your way in. Is the kid in trouble? Is that why Chandra quit? What's he done? We just want to talk to him about something he's invented, Kenzo lied. Do you know where they live? The geneticist hesitated, folding her arms. I like Chandra and don't want to. Carmen pulled out her Synth Bio IP security badge. Should I sweep your studio for expired licenses, she threatened. The large glass door slid closed and locked behind them as they left the mall. Kenzo pulled up a map on his contact lens HUD. It doesn't look that far. They only have a few minutes head start. How did those people get here before us? It's like they know what we're going to do. He stepped distractedly off the curb, urgently scanning his HUD for the nearest autocab. Suddenly, an ancient roaring diesel pickup careened around the corner, its tires screeching against the broken asphalt as it barreled toward him, spewing thick clouds of noxious exhaust. Watch out! Carmen's warning snapped Kenzo into action. With long, unused reflexes, he vaulted over a concrete barrier, narrowly avoiding the truck's deadly path. The big, rusty machine thundered past, scraping violently against the unforgiving concrete, sending sparks flying into the air. With a deafening roar, it teetered on two wheels, its momentum threatening to send it crashing onto its side. At the last instant, the driver miraculously regained control and rocketed away into the distance, leaving behind a trail of dust in its wake. Are you okay? Carmen ran across the street to where Kenzo was picking himself up. I don't think that was an accident, Kenzo growled. The autocab bounced along a potholed, treeless side street. Rundown row houses, occasionally interspersed by pockets of housing in good repair, streamed by on both sides. Kenzo brought up a timer in his HUD. Can't you go any faster? He complained to the cab's AI. Road conditions limit speed, the machine replied. Kenzo scowled. It was this, or go back to the office and pick up the SUV, Carmen pointed out. And that would have taken another half hour. How much further? Kenzo asked impatiently. You will arrive at your destination on the right in 900 meters, the car replied, slowing down to avoid a tangled field of traffic cones guarding a particularly large pothole. Kenzo swore, kneading his hands impatiently, and stared out the front windscreen, willing the stupid thing to move faster. Finally, the autocab pulled up in front of an anonymous-looking house. Rocks and sand immediately peppered its windscreen as a large, rusty pickup spun its wheels and sped off. We're too late! Kenzo snarled, jumping out of the cab to catch the rear of a pickup disappearing around a corner. That's the truck that tried to run me down! Only a dissipating dust cloud was left by the time Carmen got out to join him. Let's check out the house anyway, she encouraged, climbing the steps to the door. It was open. Hello, is anyone there? Carmen called out. When no one answered, she entered the house and looked around. Come on in, Kenzo. The place has been cleaned out. It looks like they took off a day or two ago. I suppose the only thing we can do is follow up with the neighbors, Kenzo groused, kicking an empty cardboard box across the living room. Maybe one of them knows something. It's all we've got. Carmen's handheld buzzed. She pulled it out, tapped the screen, then smiled. Maybe not. One of the drones spotted the girl and followed her. Thirty minutes later, they stood at the edge of a large encampment in front of a handmade sign, zip-tied to a telephone post that proclaimed the place to be Skid Road Heights. Population too many. Beyond the sign, a tangle of tents, shacks, and old vans were packed in so tight that it was hard to see that it once had been the site of a box store. A narrow path snaked into the heart of the makeshift community. I've got the location from the drone pinned on my HUD, Kenzo told Carmen, then walked past the sign. The smell of humanity, outdoor plumbing and cooking immediately assaulted their noses. But what distracted Kenzo was the activity. Skid Road had developed its own unique economy. Small stalls grafted to the shacks displayed all sorts of recycled and homemade goods, for which residents were noisily bartering. It made it hard to keep an eye out for someone following them. 
they finally came to an area that was mostly made from old fifth wheels, set onto blocks, and barnacled with makeshift extensions. Kenzo rechecked the map. It's the last one in the row on the left, he pointed to a trailer with faded gray swirls on its sides. A blue tarp, stapled to posts made from recycled wood, acted as a porch around the door. Kenzo scanned the area. No one seemed interested, so he walked over to the trailer and knocked. He was about to knock again when the door was opened by a slim, middle-aged woman with salt and pepper hair pulled back from her face. She stepped out, blocking the door with her body. Kenzo pulled up Morales's biometrics on his contact lens. The build and height were the same, but the distances between the eye, nose, mouth, and other key measurement points had been expertly altered to foil facial identification. In any case, the bike the girl with the XO rode was leaning against the dented aluminum side of the trailer. He had found her. What do you want? The woman spat, eyes darting from Kenzo to Carmen suspiciously. We're looking for someone named Olivia Morales. What does that have to do with me? It was evident that the woman wouldn't admit who she really was, so Kenzo pulled out a small card and handed it to her. At first, she just looked at Kenzo's hand, then grasped the card circumspectly and read it. You're a wealth recovery agent? At your service, Kenzo smiled, quickly glancing at Carmen to play along. Dr. Morales has considerable assets in Cascadia, which were automatically frozen when she disappeared. The state only holds them in trust for 40 months, and unless the owner can prove they're still alive, it takes ownership of the assets. I'm here to help the doctor claim what is rightfully hers. Of course, there is a small fee. 15%. 10, the woman countered. Kenzo turned and smiled at Carmen. There's just one catch. You need to make your claim in Cascadia, and I understand you are a person of interest there. But that's no problem. We handle cases like this all the time. We simply smuggle you and your son across the border for just long enough to fill out the paperwork, then bring you back. That's not ideal, the woman complained, but I'm tired of living like this. The panel van slid past the gleaming condo towers of the Bow Valley Mountain Enclave. Sunlight reflected from their glassy sides, casting checkered patterns across the smooth asphalt of the highway. The condition of the route had so far proved to be an exception to the usual GP zone road, and so had the cost of the toll to use it. It's the most elite district in the GP, Carmen explained. If you have legitimate business in the Bow Valley, then you can afford the toll. A forest of condos and exclusive chalets on both sides of the highway extended past the old Banff Park gates, ending just before a low mountain that partially blocked the valley. Thump, thump! The noise came from the thin wall separating the cab from the cargo area, where there was a hidden compartment with a space just big enough to hide two people. Morales and her son had just barely squeezed in. Kenzo was surprised how quickly Carmen had found the van considering biosynth investigations focused on crops and plant patent infringements, not smuggling. How long? The muffled voice demanded. It's getting stuffy in here. Kenzo just had to stay calm and focused for less than an hour, he reminded himself. After that, he would be able to put the whole Aphrodite fiasco behind him, so he deferred to Carmen. Another 15 to the turnoff, then maybe 40 minutes from there to the border, she estimated. Another twenty put them past the turn and on to the Banff-Windermere Highway. They were headed up a valley toward a narrow pass in the Kootenai Range, where the current border between the GP Zone and Cascadia lay. A small sign indicated a pullout for the Continental Divide, a line marking the direction of water flow from the mountains east or west. Turn in there, Carmen directed, pointing to an empty gravel parking area near the sign. How come? We're not near the border? Kenzo asked pulling up a map on his contact lens HUD to check their location. Change of plans, Carmen produced a taser out of her jacket and aimed it at Kenzo. What? Kenzo glanced at the weapon in surprise. Pull over, or I'll taser you. His heart pounding, Kenzo guided the van into the turnout and stopped. Get out. Carmen's finger twitched on the trigger nervously. Kenzo opened the door cautiously and backed out onto the gravel, holding his hands out so Carmen could see them. Keeping the taser pointed at him, she slid across the driver's seat and dropped to the ground, taking up a position with her back to the van. What's going on? Kenzo demanded. He had only been working with the woman for a few days, but her eyes showed a cold determination he had never seen before. 
Biosynth wasn't paid to help you, she explained in a barely controlled tone. They were paid to deliver you, Morales, and her kid. We couldn't just arrest you, so we needed all of you to cross the border voluntarily. I have to admit the wealth recovery agent was a brilliant ploy. Your bosses at Sedgenetics knew you would come up with something to convince Morales. But, if you thought they weren't going to somehow hang that embryo scam on you to save their corporate skins, then you're naive. You were going to be arrested as soon as we crossed the border. Then I was supposed to deliver the kid and his mother. It's all about the money, Kenzo. That's just the way it is. Nothing personal. So Sagenetics gets off the hook, I take the fall, and they collect a big bonus for bringing Morales in? Kenzo questioned, keeping the conversation going, hoping Carmen would let down her guard. No, she shook her head. What then? Are they after the kid's neurointerface for the EXO? It's not his invention, Carmen explained, loosening her grip on the taser. When Aphrodite modded the kid, his mother added something else. He'll stop aging at 20. She had stumbled onto the holy grail of genetic modifications, but for some reason decided not to exploit it, so she didn't document anything. But the tech helping her found out and let the other partners in on it. That's the real reason she fled. That's the real gold here. Immortality for those who can afford it. They'll use the kid as leverage to get her to sign over the IP, and when it's commercialized, everyone who owns a piece, well, Biosynth Investigations works for a percentage, not a fixed fee. This is going to be huge. Any percentage of something that game-changing will generate mountains of cash. And the people following us? They're after this aging mod, too? Kenzo slowly edged closer to the hand holding the taser. It was all a fake. A bit of theater to get you to the target fast without asking questions, and it worked, except for one thing. Carmen suddenly turned the taser around and handed it to Kenzo. Kenzo gaped at it. Take it, she insisted. If this is going to work, you'll need to use it on me. Agents at Biosnith aren't on salary. We get a percentage of the profit on each job. I guess when management finally figured out how enormous my share on this case might be, well, even my tiny fraction would have been enough to afford to retire and buy several high-end condo complexes in an enclave like the Bow Valley. Yesterday, I discovered Biosynth intended to renege and give me a tiny flat fee. I wasn't going to let that happen. So if I can't profit from this, neither will they, she growled. You've got to make it look like you overpowered me. Use the taser. Kenzo didn't like driving away, leaving Carmen lying unconscious in the pullout, but she had assured him someone would find her soon. Where should we go? He asked Morales and her son. You can help us create original content twice a month by heading over to ko-fi.com slash makeshift stories and making a one-time donation or becoming an ongoing supporter at patreon.com slash makeshift stories. And if you can, please leave us a review or rating wherever you're listening to the podcast. It helps new listeners discover us. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written and read by Alan V. Hare. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Makeshift Stories is produced by Makeshift Studios and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivative license.